I'm John Buchanan, and in this episode, what we're going to do is to take on the string line that we programmed in our first step into orchestral programming, and we're going to develop into a full string arrangement, looking at some other techniques that are required when we start working with samples in our efforts to try and bring them to life and make the most natural sounding result we can. So let's just remind ourselves of the string line that we programmed last time in episode one, and if you haven't watched that, I would go and do that before coming back here, and then we'll see how we're going to develop it. So in that previous episode, we obviously wrote the notes, but what we also spent some time doing was looking at the controllers that are responsible for shaping the way that a phrase like this can behave. And we discovered that there were three of those that were particularly useful to us. So by opening up MIDI Draw, we had a chance to see that firstly, note velocity doesn't do anything at all when it comes to actually controlling the level, but what it does do is to allow us to glide between different notes, which we can see at the low velocity values that I've programmed. And then we discovered that there were three main MIDI controllers that are helpful to us. Modulation, which controls which sample groups we're calling on when we draw our modulation lines. We're effectively calling on the samples that were recorded very quietly at low levels, very loudly at high levels and in between for those intermediate stages. We discovered that expression data controls overall MIDI volume. So effectively this is providing us with volume overall. And then we also discovered that controller number 21 controls vibrato for us, which is this idea of introducing pitch variation where in string players we put a finger on the note um, on the string that note vibrates backwards and forwards and effectively we kind of widen the pitch base giving us this kind of tremulous quite strident sound so there you go you've gone back to watch episode one and now i've just summarized it but it was still worth it okay but what we're going to do now is we're going to turn this one part into a full string arrangement now if i wanted to write for a full string orchestra that would mean violin one which is what we're currently listening to violin two violas cellos and double basses but of course i don't have to write for any more instruments than i want to so if i want the kind of full rich sort of string ensemble sound those are the instruments that i'm going to be adding to my project but if i want to i could just underscore this with no more strings i could decide to accompany this with piano or with harp one of the great things about composing is that we don't have to write for every single instrument out there but what we are going to do in this video is to turn this into more of a sort of traditional string arrangement so we can just see how we can use one part to inform another, both in terms of the actual data that's in these parts already, but also from a musical perspective, thinking about harmony, which takes us back to the music theory course from last year. See how it all comes together. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to add another track. So obviously I am using the BBC Symphonic um, samples from Spitfire Audio for uh, this uh, project that we're putting together. So the next thing I need to do is to create another track um, for my next string instrument. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click. Now, what that's going to do is to give me a new software instrument track, but there's something that seems new. I think this has been added for 10.8. What I'm going to do just for a moment is I'm going to get rid of this track. And instead, what I'm going to do is to press the plus button and I'm going to select that those are the sounds that I want to use, Spitfire Audio, BBC Symphony Orchestra, um, for my new track. And I'm going to cre uh, hit create. And of course, what that's going to do is to create a second instrument for me using these samples. I'm just going to close the interface for a moment. Now, it feels like, unless I'm massively mistaken, until version 10.8, if I double click under here, what I would get would be another software instrument track, but it would be unassigned. Whereas now, if I double click, I'm going to get another version of the BBC Symphony Orchestra. And the reason for that is it's because I've specified that that's the instrument that I want to use here for any new software instrument that I own or that I want to load. Not that I own, but that I want to load. Now, the reason why that matters is because every time I double click to create a new instrument, it's going to be this until I specify that I want a different choice here. So just be aware of that. So as it turns out, I am going to need five of these. So I'm going to just create one more I'm not worried for the moment about the fact that all of these are being created as violins one. We'll come back to that in a little while, but what I am going to do is to label them. So I'm actually going to want this one to be violin two. This is going to be the violas. This is going to be the cello part, or celli if you're feeling posh, like I am. 
And then I'm going to make this the double basses. So those are going to be the five voices within our string ensemble. And of course, what I can now do is to go through and make sure that I'm loading those instruments for each of the tracks at the moment. It's one thing to call them that, but obviously what I need to do is to be actually loading those instruments in. So this is going to be violins two, as discussed. And then what I'm going to do is to come down to the next available one, which is going to be the violas. Now, at the moment, I can see that by clicking on this track, it's not actually updating the interface. And that's because I don't have this little link button on. If I turn that on, the advantage of that is that when I open up the violas, I have a chance to specify that I want those to be the violas. So that's fine. That one's set. I'm going to press the load button. But the advantage of the link button means that when I come to the cellos, effectively this is now the interface for that particular track. So I'm going to just select the celli here. And then what I'm going to do is to come down to the last instrument, the double basses. Again, click here, and I'm in a position to specify that that is the sound that I want to load. So the link button is useful because it means that every time I change track, I'm going to see the interface that relates to that particular track. Now, again, I can write my string arrangement however I like. I might decide to work from top to bottom and use my first violin line as a means to write a second violin line and then a viola part and then a cello part. But actually what I really want to do is to underscore the harmony of this line, to work out what notes I actually want to use underneath this particular part. So I effectively want to write a kind of bass line or a supporting note underneath all of these notes. So I can do that, of course, a number of different ways. I could put a loop around this piece and I could just experiment with some notes until I find something that I like. Or, of course, what I could do would be to use the first violin part to create one of the other parts within my project and perhaps um, a bass line. And there are advantages to that, too. But before I do either of those things, what I'm actually going to do is to do what I always do when I'm writing for orchestra, which is that I'm actually going to create a brand new empty channel strip and to that, from the library, I'm just going to load a piano sound. Now, like lots of people, um, I like writing on the piano. And so therefore, it makes sense to have an instrument which is capable of playing all of the notes for me at once. Whereas we tend to think about string lines as being one musical line followed by another one on another instrument. The great thing about a piano is that I can think about the notes of the melody and the kind of bass line underneath. And we can kind of map out the piece that we want to write before we then assign those sounds to um, the instruments that we're working on. So let's just play the violin through again, and then we'll play this piece through on the piano and start thinking about how we might harmonize it. Okay, so we've got this first phrase, this little sort of sequence that runs upwards. So I'm hearing that as a kind of... So effectively, this piece is at the moment in C minor, and I'm hearing the first chord as a kind of G major, a sort of chord five. And then coming back to this chord one for the second phrase. And then it goes up here, now, we could do anything with this note, so we could stay in C minor, although that would be a bit boring, I think. So what I'm actually going to do is to drop to an A flat major chord, but with this kind of seventh on top of it. And then we could go to an F. And then I'm going to go back to chord five before going to one. So we get... that kind of a shape. So again, do go and watch the music theory course if all of that just made no sense at all. But effectively what we're doing is we're looking at melody and we're looking at supporting notes to harmonize as ever. If what you want to do is simply just experiment by putting a loop round and trying out different notes, you can absolutely achieve really great results too. Just keep your ears wide open. Okay, so one thing I could do would be to come down to the cellos and I could play in those notes supporting this part. Now, cellos tend to exist a bit more down here. So let's start in this kind of an octave and see where that takes us. I'm just going to put in those notes that I was just playing a moment ago.
Okay, so we've got those notes in. They're very quiet, but we already know how to fix that. A little recap, how are we gonna fix it? That's right, modulation and expression data. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But what I've got now, if I double click here, is that I can see that I've got these notes. Now, every once in a while, you might notice on a MIDI region like this that you get these two little spikes or a series of data lines. And you might be thinking, well, what are those? Well, as we can see from the part that's up here, I've got lots of those data lines and we know that. This is the expression data and the modulation data and the um, uh, vibrato data that I've put in for this particular part, which suggests that whenever we get little marks like this, they must relate to some sort of data. Now, I didn't touch any dials while I was playing it, so somehow this data has come in from somewhere and it must relate to something. And if you're ever wondering or thinking, how do I go and find out what that is, it will always be listed within this list. So it turns out that somehow some modulation data has got in, which makes me think I must have just flicked this as I began to play. And certainly these notes are pretty quiet and they were as I went through that recording. But if ever you're thinking, well, where have these come from? And by the way, one really obvious example of the sort of data that you might inadvertently put into a project like this would be aftertouch data. So if the keyboard that you're playing on has the potential to create aftertouch messages, so in other words, you can play a note and then you can squeeze that note harder and to use that as a controller, suddenly you might find that you've got an aftertouch line here. In which case, if you want to just get rid of it altogether, well, we'll see how that's done in a moment. But firstly, you can just always find any data lines right here. How would you go about getting rid of it? Well, we can select all of those points and simply throw them away. And now there is no data line for that particular parameter. But of course, I am going to need it because modulation is my friend here. We're going to need that for the cello part. OK, so before I go through the process of just rewriting modulation data in the way that we did in episode one, one thing I could do would be to do something quite interesting, which would be to take the shape of what we created for the first violins and to use it for the cellos. In other words, do I want the same undulations in this? Do I want the same notes to grow in volume from a modulation perspective, dynamics, and from an expression perspective, volume, and from a vibrato perspective as well? Well, we could try that. What I'm going to do is to take this first violin line and I'm going to copy it to any old track. It doesn't matter where it sits. And what I'm then going to do is to double click here, having copied it, and I'm going to select all of the note information, that's command A to select all. And when I get rid of that, whilst I get rid of the notes, I don't get rid of the data lines. They all still exist. So what I could now do would be to take both of these points and I can hit command and J, which is going to join those regions together. And whilst the track is now labeled violin one and whilst it's on the violas line, neither of those things I want. I'm going to just move it back down to the cellos. I'm going to rename it, which is Shift, Option, and N. And now I've got my cello notes, but with all of the data from the first violin part. So now I'm going to get the shape and the movement, which I had from violin one. So what does the cello sound like with that movement? Well, it sounds like this. OK, so we got our fade out on that last note as we did with the first violins. Let's listen to the two instruments together. OK, well, that's kind of working, but I need to be a little bit careful because it would be very easy to be seduced by this. I've got to write a second violin line and a viola line and a double bass line. And now I've just learned that there's a shortcut for copying all of that data. And if it were the case that I got seduced enough that I just copied all of this data to all five of those parts, I might as well just be playing one string ensemble patch because all of those notes are going to follow or adhere to exactly the same kind of shape. So I'm going to resist the temptation to do what I've just done with the other parts. And what I'm also going to do is to edit these parts so that they have their own sense of shape. So what I really want 
is for these notes to feel a little bit like what we refer to as a kind of marcato, where we get the start of the note that's kind of marked and then it tails away. I kind of want these cello notes, at least for these first two notes, to kind of play and then go and then play and then go. And we've got this kind of sense of this kind of impact at the beginning. So I'm going to do that with the modulation line. So I've got a nice loud sample which fades away a little bit. And I'm going to do that for both of these notes make sure that that happens. And I'm also going to do the same thing with the expression data so that from a volume perspective, we're kind of marking the front of these notes and then we're allowing them to fade. And I'm going to do the same thing right here on the start of this note. So again, we've got this kind of shape that's happening more like, let's get rid of that point for a moment, more like this. And I'm also going to do the same thing even with the vibrato. So whereas what we've done with the first violin line is to wait for the long note to happen before the vibrato kicks in, because this is a long note for the cellos, I'm going to just give this kind of a shape to these notes. So we get more vibrato at the top and it sort of disappears a little bit. And that's going to change the kind of strident nature of this note as it plays through. And we're going to end up with this nice sort of hard start, which then just mellows a little bit as that note plays back. So again, just the cellos by themselves for a moment. Let's just have a quick listen to how that sounds just on those two notes. And now we get into the next part of the phrase where rather than the note playing and then disappearing, we've got this much more sort of smooth line, which probably means that more like the shape that we've got in the first violin line is going to work, that we've got this kind of slow, gradual build up from a um, vibrato perspective. But maybe what I'm going to do is to just make sure that we've got a kind of note that sort of starts, maybe goes on a little bit of a journey through here, drops away a little bit, and then builds up an intensity to towards the end. What I'm going to do again is to make this data line unique so that it's just the cellos part and it isn't just the same as the first violins. And maybe we'll mirror that kind of movement with um, the overall volume as well. So again, we sort of start loudish here, it then drops away a little bit. And then maybe what we do towards the end is to end up with a lot more intensity going into the top of that um, final note. That sort of a shape, in other words. OK, let's have a listen to that by itself. Okay, and it might be nice for us to have one of our little glissandos on this note as well, which means coming back to note velocity and just making sure that this last note is really, really quiet, which means it will swoop down to that note. That was silly of me to use the word quiet. I don't mean quiet, I mean a low velocity. Remember, volume is being controlled by expression. Okay, so we've got a cello line, which we have brought in by playing in the notes, but by borrowing that data from that other line. And now we've got two separate parts, and I can see that they're um, running side by side. Okay, now for the kind of inner parts, what I want to do is to not use long notes, but instead to look at using short notes. So what I'm going to do is to open up the interface for Violin 2, and what we're going to do here is to come and find a different um, articulation. Now, there are a couple here that might potentially work depending on what I want this piece to kind of be. In other words, do I want it to be this kind of strident sort of sound where, and I think I do want this, by the way, where effectively what I get is an inner string line. that's doing this kind of running thing, in which case these super short spiccato notes I think are going to work nicely. Staccato gives me a similar kind of thing, but with a slightly longer version of a short note. OK, so effectively we've got a similar kind of a thing, but with a slightly longer version. Or I could go for pizzicato which gives us this slightly more magical thing where we're not using bows, and instead the string is being plucked. Really good for kind of more magical things. Now, I think I want this kind of hard, strident sort of sound, so I'm going to start in spiccato world, and we'll see how that feels. OK, so everything we've learnt so far about how notes get controlled and the fact that um, volume is not controlled by velocity is undone the moment we start working with short samples. You've probably already heard that if I play quiet notes, 
or low velocities, I get quiet notes. And if I play louder velocities, I get loud notes. So with short articulations, like staccato, like spiccato, like pizzicato, suddenly velocity goes back to doing the thing that we associate it doing whenever we play synthesizers or whenever we play Logic's sort of internal software instruments. So now velocity does control volume. And that, of course, is something I'm going to have to think about a little bit. Now, what I think I want to do here is to have this kind of running kind of inner part that's happening here. And again, I need to think a little bit about my harmony. Um, but what I'm going to do is to just have a bit of a play with how I think this might go. And again, the sort of piano might be my friend here a little bit in terms of mapping this out. So at the top, I've got this. And there's my cello note at the bottom. So I've got a G major chord here. So just thinking about the kind of inner parts for those first two bars. So what I think I'm interested in doing is filling in the kind of harmony a little bit here for the first violin. So if I'm playing a G major chord and I've got a G in the bass and I've got a D in the melody, what I might do would be to use these two notes to give me this shape, including the B natural, before doing that. So in other words, coming back to um, the kind of C minor chord with E flat and C. So I'm going to just put in those two bars. We'll see how that sounds. And then we can spend some time looking at how volume works with these short articulations. This is just these two bars. Okay, let's just stop there for one moment. So we've just got those two bars. Now I'm playing 16th notes here, not very accurately, it must be said. Let's just have a quick look at the notes that I've played. So what we've got is our D to a B in the G minor, in the G major chord, and then an E flat to a C in um, the C minor chord. And my timing is appallingly bad. I can see that this note is really early. Let's see whether or not quantize is going to help me here. Look at that, it's like it never happened. Perfect timing. Hmm. Okay, but we've also learned that velocity is really important. So let's just solo this for one moment, because with these short articulations, this is how I'm going to control volume. Now again, MIDI draw being open, showing me note velocity is really helpful, because I've got a chance to see these notes one at a time and to see exactly how I might want them to work. So I'm thinking about these as a kind of ba 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 So I want a nice loud note on the downbeats. I'm hearing the upper two notes as probably being a bit louder than the lower two notes. So effectively what I'm doing is I'm creating a little kind of pattern, I suppose, using velocity to think about controlling how I want the volume to work. So in solo mode, I suppose the sort of shape I'm thinking about is that the second note is an echo of the first, but that probably the top two notes are louder than the bottom two. So this kind of a shape, louder, softer, louder, softer, but with the second two, quieter than the first two, if that makes sense. Now again, having done that, the temptation would be to just say, okay, I like that shape. I'm going to just throw away those notes and duplicate them because then I know I've got that same shape again. Yeah, but they're exactly the same. And if I was actually working with a violin ensemble, whilst I could say that's the kind of shape I want them to be, they wouldn't be identical the second time around. So it's much better for me to not do that and instead to think, okay, well, I know that that's the shape that I want, but I'm going to just make sure that these values are just a little bit different so that each time they've got their own unique kind of shape. And again, what I could do would be to use the pencil tool. So I could create a little arrow here, just controlling these first two notes. And then I could do the same thing here. So I'm just literally clicking where I want the first note to happen. I'm drawing over the second note. And effectively, that's giving me a chance to create those shapes too. So by themselves, they sound like this. OK, so I might have slightly overdone that in terms of the overall dynamic shape, which means I could then select all of these notes and I could use the velocity slider to bring them all up. So effectively, we're thinking about velocity both on an individual note basis, but also as an overall setting. And there's one more thing I could do with velocity as well. If it turns out that I've created something which is too dynamic, in other words, the difference between the loudest velocities and the quietest velocities is too big, what I could also do would be to restrict them by selecting this whole region here, 
coming to the dynamics pane up here and saying, okay, I want to take these down to 75%, let's say, of their current velocity range. Now, when I do that, what that's going to do is to basically make the difference between the quietest and the loudest notes smaller, but we actually don't see that until not only I select it up there, but I press Control and N, which is going to normalize that setting that I've just made. And we can now see that it's applied it here. So effectively, I've still got the offsets, but they're just a bit closer together than they were, just giving me less dynamic range. OK, let's hear that with the first violins. OK, so they're feeling a bit quiet to me. And of course, there are a few things that we could do about that. So firstly, what we could do would be to remember that even though velocity is controlling the strength of these notes, we still have MIDI expression available to us. So we can open this up and we can definitely create a, um, an expression line. And we can make sure that the expression data is nice and bold for this particular part. That's one way that we can control the overall volume. Of course, the other thing that we can do is to come back to the MIDI expression for the other parts and offset them or we can use the volume faders for these individual tracks. So to give the second violins a little bit more love and a little bit more volume overall, I'm going to drop the first violin volume a little bit, and definitely the cellos are feeling a little bit bold to me as well. So again, if I wanted to look at how to control that a second way, a different way, I can open this part up, come back to the expression line, I can select all of the points here that are playing a role in this part, and I can just drop their volume overall. So definitely a part of working with orchestral samples is thinking about all of the ways in which you can control the behavior of the overall kind of expression of the notes and their kind of musical purpose, and then the actual data that's controlling the way that they sound. Okay, so we've got half a first viol uh, second violin part. Let's go back to the top again for a moment. In fact, actually, I'm going to give these a little bit of extra velocity here as well. OK, that's working nicely. Now, what I am going to do is I'm going to take the notes that I've written here. I'm going to chop them at the beginning of bar two, which is now bang in time because I use quantize. Cheating. Nevertheless, I'm going to copy them to here. Now, these aren't the right notes for the next part of this piece, but I like the pattern and I like the velocity shape of the patterns that I've worked with as well. So I think it's going to be quicker for me to think about how I want to work with these notes by just copying them to here. OK, so at this point, what my harmony does is to go A flat major 7, F minor 7, and then up to a G. So what I'm going to do is to come back into the uh, second violin part here. And what I'm going to do is to think, right, so this is an A flat major chord, which means I'm going to use E flat and C at this point. And then what I'm going to do is to allow these to fall as the melody does as well. And these are going to become C and A flat, and that's over the F minor chord. And then we're going to be into the final section where I think we get to a G. So this time, what I'm going to do is, I suppose I could keep dropping these. I'm going to come to a B and a G, which is there. And then I think we're close to, unless I put these in the wrong places, I think we're getting into the sort of end of the piece. Oh yeah, right, fine, sorry, the chord moves there. My mistake. So let's move these as well. OK, so we could do this. We could just have this happen, where we get back to a C right on the end. So effectively, what we've got is our harmony falling as the melody does. And we've got this kind of repeating pattern. But it's a little bit boring, isn't it? So let's think about this a little bit more. What I want to do is to get a little bit more movement into this. So what I'm actually going to do is to take this up to a D. So we've got a little bit of variation there. And then what I might do would be to, hmm, there are so many things we could do. Let's think about this. Let's build to a bit more of a kind of 
interesting climax. Are you still here? Well, that's a little bit more interesting, but we could keep playing with these notes and doing some interesting things with them. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, but it doesn't sound in time anymore, and you'd be 100% right. So one of the problems with comparing or using together at the same time long samples, so in other words, legato patches, like we are with the first violins and the cellos, and short patches, as we are with the second violins where we're using the spiccato patch, is that the spiccato speaks immediately. If I put my violin under my chin and I put my bow on the string and I play a short aggressive note, bang, it effectively starts straight away. And so the short samples are always going to sound closer to the beat than anything that's got a long attack time as the legato patches have. And so what we get is this kind of problem. I'm going to run the click and we're going to listen to just the second violins for a moment. Let's join those regions together. And just listening to the click and these, uh, these notes, we're going to hear that they sound pretty good from a timing perspective. Now, they're a little bit behind the beat, but not so much. Now let's listen to the first violin part with the click. So they are a lot more behind the beat. Now, one of the earliest videos that we made, well, when was it? A long time ago, when dinosaurs roamed the earth and there were fewer synthesizers there, we made a video all about MIDI delay, which is the notion of taking moments like this, problems like this, and putting things in time. Now, delay is a confusing word to use in music production terms because we tend to think about delay as being an echo effect. But effectively, if you think about the word delay, if something is delayed, it's late, it's held back. And what we can do with MIDI delay is that we can move things further back in time, making our problem worse, or we can use a negative delay, and two negatives make a positive. Aha. So if we were to take this part, Again, we'll keep it soloed, and again, we'll put a loop around it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a delay here on this part, and any positive value in ticks literally will move the um, file later in time, in tiny little fractions of time, units of time, subdivisions of a 16th note. But any negative value will basically bring things earlier, which is what I want. I want to bring things in time until they feel like they're adhering to the click. Let's do that now. Okay, so that's feeling a lot better. Now, it could be that I haven't gone far enough. I've just literally played um, this through once and I'd need to keep sort of revising this. How much do I need to move things forward? Well, that's musical and personal taste. It will depend very much on the samples that you're using. It will depend on the tempo of your project. It will depend on the feel that you want. Actually, these strings being a little bit late and yearning a little bit might be no bad thing. So again, depending on how strict I want things to be, that's totally up to me. I'm going to go with this value for now. We can always change it, but I'm going to have the same problem with the cello. So before I do anything else, I'm going to select that part too. And I'm also going to bring these back. And because they're the same samples made by the same manufacturer, it's probably pretty likely that they're going to have been programmed the same way. So a similar kind of value might feel quite good. Now then, let's see how that feels now with the longs and the shorts playing together. <laughs> Okay, well, it doesn't sound fantastic. Let's put these parts together and see if they're working. Mm -hmm. 
So it definitely feels to me like the cellos are a little bit ahead. So everything I've just said about the same value being appropriate to both parts is clearly not true. Let's try that again. Okay, and let's put the short strings back under the microscope and see just how in time they are, or otherwise. Okay, that feels like it should feel better. And it does. Okay, so I'm happy with that. I think that's feeling quite good. Now, again, we need to be really careful because the temptation, if we usually make electronic music or we're used to working with short plucky synthesizers and sounds that just respond really nicely to being perfectly in time, is that we just quantize all of this, all of these notes, absolutely. And I would really resist that. Yes, I have quantized the second violin part, so I'll hold my hands up. But what we don't want to do is to make sure that every single note feels like it's been programmed by a computer. And so a little bit of this kind of interplay between parts being in and out from a timing perspective, I think is useful to us. Okay, now what we can definitely do is to use our second violin part to help us create our viola part. Again, what I want to do here is to come back to these kind of spiccato notes. And what I'm going to do is to copy this part down to here. Again, I'm going to immediately rename it because I want to be able to see immediately that I'm dealing with the violas, not with the second violins. But effectively, I want these kind of interlocking parts in the middle. Now, I could just have these two parts play all the same notes, and that might actually sound quite good. This kind of unison certainly gives us a real toughness. But what I kind of want to do is to have these parts play together, but be part of the same chord, but supporting a chord. And the problem with the same notes playing across two parts is we don't get a chord, we just get this kind of unison feel. So again, I'm going to use a little bit of music theory here. I'm thinking, okay, well then fine. I know that this is a G major chord, G, B natural, D. Those are my three notes. So I've got D and B playing in the second violin. So it stands to reason that if I was to select these notes and move them down so that the top note is a B and the lower note is a G, then what we should find is that effectively these two um, sets of notes together are going to provide us with our G major chord. And they are. Now, one thing that's really interesting about logic, and most of the time is not that helpful, is to select two lots of data at once. And what you'll see is that the MIDI pane underneath will show you those notes. Now, the reason I say it's not very useful is we can't tell immediately which notes are allocated to the second violins and which notes are allocated to the cellos. I mean, we know because we've just programmed them that these are the second violins and these are the cellos. Sorry, that these are the violas. But by selecting both of them together, at least what I get a chance to do is to firstly see if I've made any mistakes in terms of how the notes are working, but also I just get a chance to reassure myself that all of those notes adhere to the chord that I want to be working with. So that kind of approach feels like it should work in the second bar where I want uh, this kind of reinforcement of a C minor chord. So here is my C minor chord, E flat and C. So these would become C and G, those are the notes of the C minor chord. So I think that's gonna feel quite good there. Okay, so my next chord is an A flat major seven. So I'm using E flat and C, so these could become C's and A flats. And then we've got our kind of F minor. Um, oh, okay, yeah, right. So we had an F minor here and I've put a D in the uh, second violin line. That's a bit fruity. That's a bit of a fruity moment of me. I'm going to just fix that there. See, it's quite useful when we get a chance to just see these notes up close and personal. So I'm going to come back here for a moment to my second violin, to my viola part. So these are now an E flat in the second violins. So they can be a, let's think about this for a moment. I'm going to make those, um, I'm going to make those a C and then they can be an F. If you are in any doubt as to whether or not 
I have made this in advance and all of that sort of stuff. Hopefully now you're you can see that I haven't. So there we are. Let's just hear those bars for a moment. That's working, isn't it? That's nice. Okay, let's come back to here. We've got our big finale, which is our G's again here. So we're going to go, that's a B, so that's going to go down to a G, and that's going to go down to a D. D. Do you know, it's so tempting because Will's sitting over there and he was here for the music theory course. Tempted to test him, but I'm not going to. Not going to. Well, what note should these be? Didn't say that out loud. That didn't happen. We could try a little F there. And then we're going to go to a G and then we're going to go to a B. Nearly there, I promise. And then we're going to finish on a G. Nice. Let's try that with everything playing together. Okay, I'm not loving that last chord, but we can begin to hear the kind of power that comes from this. Now, what's really interesting is that now that we've got two kind of strident inner voices playing these parts, the first violin doesn't sound loud enough again. So again, I'm going to come back to my mixer and what I'm going to do is to put that fader back where it was. And this is the thing about orchestral programming is that you'll constantly be adjusting faders, adjusting MIDI data, whether that's modulation and expression, whether it's velocity, routings, all sorts of things. Now that both of these parts are here and they're playing together, I could definitely take the velocities down overall because effectively they're reinforcing each other. And we've got one last thing we can do here as well, which is to think about the double basses. Now, double basses are very much our friends because what tends to happen with double bass writing, not always, but frequently, is that what people will do is to use the cello part for the double bass part, but just offset an octave lower. So we get this kind of octave extension for this particular part. And what I'm actually going to do is to restrict myself to just the last note that effectively I'm liking the way that this ensemble sounds, but I just want this note right at the end to be reinforced. Now, because I don't know that that's definitely what I want the whole way through, the parts, just my intuition is telling me that. Rather than throwing these notes away, I'm going to use Control and M and I'm going to mute them, which means that I can bring them back in at any stage, rather than just getting rid of them and then thinking, right, actually, you know what, I need more of the cello line. I'm just going to use it for this one note for now. So let's do that um, and see how that feels just with this last note being reinforced with the double basses. And of course, we need to name them. <laughs> All right, that's a nice fruity note right on the bottom. Let's have a listen to that. Now, because double basses go so low, we could even try that. It's the end of the world. That really is the end of the world. Okay, so what we need to do is, of course, just be thinking a little bit about the volume shape. That note doesn't need to be nearly so loud, and probably it doesn't need that amount of modulation data either. It doesn't need to start from such a loud sample, but just a little bit of reinforcement. is nice. So what we've done in this second part of our, orchest um, our orchestral programming course, that's quite a hard thing to say, or in this particular sort of second stage, is that we've done a number of different things. We started by taking one part and copying it down to another, using the data from the first violin line to act as a kind of overall shaper for the cello part. And that was both useful and less useful. We got a chance to think about that line as an individual thing, but certainly if we're working with long um, sort of lines, that's a, a way of sort of kickstarting the process of bringing in the same sort of shape. But what we've mostly done is to spend th time thinking about the inner parts and working with short samples alongside 
longer samples. And what that means from a timing perspective, but also learning that velocity suddenly does now control volume in a way that we're kind of used to when we're working with synth parts. And we've seen right at the end of here how we can quickly use a cello line to create a sort of double bass part. Now this still needs loads of refinement. We're just at the kind of writing stage and we're still only dealing with just a few bars of music. But if what you want to do is to take a line like we created in episode one and turn that into kind of more of an ensemble, we've seen also just how much it is helpful to be able to sort of think about your music theory knowledge and thinking about how chords can feed the choices that you make from a sort of notes perspective. So lots of things have come together in this episode and will proceed on um, in future videos as well.